Okay, guys, I am setting up a Fabry Pro cavity, which is basically a pipe organ, but instead of uh, using acoustic waves, sound waves, we are going to have a buildup of an electromagnetic field, an oscillating electromagnetic field. Fabry Pro cavity is a pipe organ for light. Uh, it has the same kind of boundary conditions that give you the interference effects that you're looking for. So let me walk through the optics a little bit and explain what we're doing. This is going to be the part where you get seasick watching me move the laptop around. All right. There is a Heaney laser. It's a green one, not the common red one, but it's on him after. Hang on a second. This is awkward. Okay, that square thing, that is a laser. It is a diode laser, and it emits at, what is it, 520 nanometers. It can be tuned in a small area around there. So it's got two cables connected to it. One connects to a TEC, a thermoelectric cooler, and it allows us to temperature stabilize the laser so that it always operates at a given temperature. Um, that's because if we change the temperature of the diode that's emitting the light, we're effectively changing the uh, length of the, the laser cavity. So it's yet another standing wave kind of effect. Um, we're changing the length of the cavity and the laser will tune to adjust to that change. So we stabilize it to, I think about a hundredth of a degree Celsius. The other cable is just a power supply. It just rams current through the diode and uh, whole recombination causes light to be emitted. So let me wave something in the beam path. Forgot to turn off the laser. Here we go. You can see there's some green glow there. That's uh, spontaneous artifact stuff. But there is the beam. It's all blown out. You've got blooming on the CCD. So the spot in real life is uh, smaller than that. What you're seeing is saturation effect where the, the camera is just getting completely blown out. And when I wave this card over here, you saw a second spot. That's from this other laser. That's the Heaney gas laser. Um, I'd originally set this up to use that for this experiment, but it's a little underpowered. I can't remember. I think it's like half a, half a milliwatt, uh, which is fine. We could use that, but um, I am being quick and lazy, and I'm going to align this uh, Fabry Pro cavity, which is over here, by blasting away with a fair amount of power. So let's take a look at the cavity. It's the silvery pipe there. That big black hoop thing around it is just a mount that allows you to pitch and yaw it. The silver thing, this tube, it's probably uh, machined out of Invar or something. This was built by Coherent in like 1989, 1990. It is just a mount for two high reflectivity mirrors. So they have a, uh, a focus, a focal length that brings the beam to a focus halfway between the mirrors. So you have a, a cute little uh, very, very tidy confocal cavity, the details of which aren't really important for us right now. It's just that it's easier to align this thing than having two flat mirrors. With two flat mirrors, you could think of it as, oh, I've got light coming in and then bouncing back, back and forth inside the cavity until eventually squeaks out at the other side or back in the front direction. Um, just because those mirrors aren't perfect reflectors. The same thing essentially happens when we have the curved mirrors, but it's easier to get the system aligned uh, than it is with flat mirrors. If I try this with flat mirrors, what typically ha happens is, if I want to think of a photon, I have a, a beam of light, the photon comes in and rattles around, and then because of some minor misalignment between the flat mirrors, the light squeaks out by leaving the cavity perpendicularly instead of bouncing back and forth between the high reflector mirrors. So putting a, a curved lens, excuse me, a curved mirror here and here means that the light's always being focused back towards the middle. So it, it stays inside the cavity for a larger number of round trips. Anyway, I've roughly aligned the beam into this sucker. So you can see there is a, a huge bloom, but then there's a hot spot inside of there. And that's the beam going into the front side of the cavity. And then, let's see if you can see it. Yep, 
you can see a spot on this card behind the cavity. And that spot is uh, actually an interference between multiple passes of the cavity. All right, so if I, if I brush a component in the beam path, you'll see a little flutter, and that's because there are these two electromagnetic waves, the wavelength of which is 520 nanometers long, and if I perturb any of the mechanical components, they sort of scan back and forth past each other. So the interference goes from fully constructive through fully destructive, and, and you know every point in between in that moment where I just brush it. So this is the first step to getting this thing aligned. I'm now gonna fine tune the alignment, and then we're gonna put a sensor on the back end of this cavity and scan, calls to mechanically adjust, scan the length of the cavity so that we can intentionally cause that, that interference effect to occur in a controlled fashion. All right, so I'm gonna pause the video, go drink something with some caffeine in it, and then try to get that alignment done. Okay, guys, I'm trying to make sure you see this. Uh, there's a little bit of a flicker to that spot, and it's not just a laser being weird. It's actually due to interference uh, between different modes in the laser cavity. So if I make any small adjustment, you can see there's some sort of complicated structure to that spot. It's not just the case that the light comes through the back of the, the cavity and then hits the card. It's got internal reflections going on inside the cavity and those interfere with each other and form fringes, just like in an interferometer of any other kind. All right, so now that we've got this thing coarsely aligned, I'm gonna put that sensor on. Okay, so we have the, uh, what is it, not the Heaney, the diode laser aligned into the Fabry Pro cavity. Um, that was just a, a matter of fiddling with some mirrors for a little bit. And what we can see is, an, unpleasant to look at interference pattern. So once again, we have the laser, that's that black square thing, and it is emitting light at about 520 nanometers. There you go, you can see the spot there. It looks enormous, it's not that big. The beam travels from the laser, hits a couple of uh, mirrors here, it's obscured there, and here, and then comes into this gizmo, which is that, that tube with two high reflectivity mirrors that forms a cavity, just causes light to bounce back and forth inside the cavity multiple times. All right, so we have a sensor. It's this part here. It's not exactly built to look different on a webcam video, but it's just a photodiode and it outputs a small voltage when light hits it. So as we adjust the length of this tube, we change the spacing of the cavity and we change what modes can, it, can undergo or exhibit constructive interference in that cavity. So if we change the length of the cavity, we will change which mode builds up inside the cavity, what frequency of light builds up inside the cavity, and what frequency of light will, will then have a little bit leak out from the back side of the cavity and onto the photosensor. So this provides us with a tool. We can intentionally change the length of the cavity. And we do that by applying a, a voltage to a component in here, a piezo. Um, whenever you hear a little buzzer or something, and it sounds unpleasant to listen to, a little kind of screechy noise kind of thing, that's probably a piezo component. You just apply a voltage across this thing and it's asymmetric not asymmetric. It's, it's crystal structure that lacks inversion symmetry will then expand or contract as you apply that voltage. So that lets us change the length of something. You can use it to build a speaker because it's a small actuator. It's something that'll wiggle back and forth. Or you can use it to change the length of a cavity. We do that and different frequencies of light will be transmitted through the, uh, the cavity. There's another step in there I want to emphasize. Light will come in. And if it has exactly the right number of half wavelengths that fit inside that cavity, it will build up, right? You'll get multiple reflections and you'll get buildup of light. Then the small amount of leakage through the mirrors will cause whatever modes had just the right frequency slash wavelength to build up 
to, to, to send a little bit of light onto the photo sensor. All right, so we will then observe those modes. We'll observe those frequencies of light as intensity peaks as we scan the cavity. All right, so let's look at this extremely unpleasant looking mess. That's horrifying. All right, so you can see this yellow triangle wave. That's the drive signal that's being sent to the fabry perot cavity that changes its length. So as you increase the voltage, you expand the length of the cavity, and you change which half wavelength will fit in there exactly. These blue feathery things are the modes that then build up at those different wavelengths. The green laser diode is a multi-mode laser. It's simultaneously operating at a bunch of frequencies. So you can see these individual modes, there's power at all these different frequencies, right? It looks to the eye like it's just a single color. And if we sent it into a spectrometer like we did when we were looking at that unknown laser that turned out to be a green heaney, it would look like just a single wavelength. I mean, that's not strictly true. A diode laser will look like it maybe spans a fraction of a nanometer. But when we look at it with this fine precision resolution that we get from a spectrum analyzer like this, that's what the Fabry Perot is serving as, we see that there's all this stuff inside. We can convince ourselves of some things about it though. So I think that looking at that, I can see a sort of repetition of patterns. There's, there's a shape here to this that I feel like is reflected in reverse on the other side of that peak. So let me fiddle with the scan width. So if I scan more, I should see patterns that recur. And I think that I do, right? The shape of this, I think, repeats itself. And that's because I've scanned across one set of wavelengths that the laser emits, and I've observed all the different half integer multiples of the wavelength that will fit in there. There's multiple wavelengths in this laser's emission. And then I keep going, and I manage to fit them in a second time with another half integer multiple of their wavelength. So that's why we're seeing these patterns that appear. But looking at this broadband laser with this kind of tool just makes me feel gross. It's an ugly looking spectrum. All right, so what else can we do? Well, first of all, let's turn off the green laser. Now, I went and I replaced the green Heaney with this red Heaney laser over here. You've seen the red Heaney laser a trillion times in your life. Uh, where's a good spot? There you go. You can see it there. You're seeing the, the spot through the backside of that, that paper card I'm waving in the beam path. All right, so I'm going to send that into the spectrum analyzer instead. I have a mirror that should, in principle, snap back into place when I drop it in there. So now I have no green light, but I have the red light being sent into the spectrum analyzer. The wavelength range of the spectrum analyzer's mirrors, the, the span for which those things actually are really high reflectivity mirrors, it, it's, it's like 550 to 650 nanometers. The red of a Heaney is 632.8 nanometers. So this is actually way better matched to the performance of the, of the spectrum analyzer. All right, so what do we get? Something that's a lot more pleasant to look at. All right, so I'm going to fiddle with the alignment just a hair because when I drop this mirror back into its platform, I feel like it doesn't not move a little bit. You know what I mean? There's definitely some deviation from my previous alignment job. All right, so what do I see? I see two modes there. You guys can see that okay. There's two wavelengths. It's 632.8 nanometers, but not exactly, right? There's two different components in there, and you can see that they're kind of competing for which one is eating up all the gain in the device. The exact details of this process aren't important. It's, it's suitable for discussing in a senior level course on, on laser physics. But multiple different wavelengths of light can be emitted by this thing due to the broad nature of the neons uh, emission, essentially. A gain curve is what I want to say, but I, I don't want to get into the details again. So as the temperature of the Heaney tube changes, 
you walk back and forth and get emission on different wavelengths. Um, several of them, usually two, are viable. And as the uh, length of the cavity changes, you'll get two emission lines that kind of walk back and forth and split power. Now, if you look closely, you can see there's structure in there. I think that might be some kind of etaloning effect. Again, that's not within the scope of our class. I think it's some sort of uh, interference that I haven't properly aligned the system to zero out. Uh, everyone's busy, right? Me too. We're all struggling to get stuff done. So I'm not going to spend another hour fiddling with this and trying to remember the first time I aligned one of these things, which was probably 2004 when the world was young as far as you guys are concerned. All right, let's zoom back out a little bit. So I can see my pattern there. Well, I, I'm going to change the offset of my scan. So I'm just adding in a, a DC voltage to the piezo, I'm lowering the voltage or raising the voltage. And you can see that that feature moves back and forth, or rather that pair of features moves back and forth as I change the voltage. Because I'm changing where during my cycle of, of scanning this thing's length, i.e. applying that voltage, I'm changing where a half integer number of wavelengths can exactly fit into the cavity. All right, I'm also gonna try changing the amplitude of the scan. So if I scan over a shorter range, maybe I just see two spikes during one scan. So I'm lengthening the cavity here, and I'm shortening it here, and it repeats ad infinitum. And I only see those emissions once. But if I really crank up the amplitude of this thing, and I have to fiddle with the offset to keep my features centered. If I crank up the amplitude, oh, a new feature appears, right? It's not a new feature. It's the same old pair of wavelength uh, lines that are just now cropping up a second time because now the length of the cavity has changed enough that it can fit in again, right? Uh, I'll go do a little bit of chalk and talk to sort of work through how this is behaving. Um, I set this up using a digital oscilloscope and I kind of regret it because it makes this always look a little strange. You get that like popping up and down of the, the wavelength lines that somehow doesn't look as bad when it's getting effectively smeared out with a, uh, an ancient analog oscilloscope. But that's something that probably nobody but me who's looking at this cares about. All right, so I'm gonna shut this thing down and we're gonna go do a little chalk and talk to discuss how all this stuff works. Okay, so before we do anything else, let's just speak briefly to the problem of a pipe organ. So I, I sketched one over here at the edge. We're just saying we have some structure, and it's a length L, and it can support standing waves that exhibit a certain relationship between their wavelength and the length of the structure. So I sketched in a, a, a kind of illustrative wave or two of them actually, that look like waves on a string, but you could think of it as the high pressure or rarefaction regions of a pressure wave that's, that's standing in this column if it were a pipe organ. So you have the, the fundamental, which is the lowest order, where lambda over two is exactly equal to L. So half the wavelength exactly fits into the, uh, into the structure with, with the standing wave. So you can see that here. It's a little hard to see, but I mean, you've seen it already a thousand times in the book. And then the next highest structure that can fit in there, excuse me, next highest wave that can fit in there is the lambda is equal to L first harmonic. And that's the one where you fit the entire uh, wavelength into the, the pipe. So that's how a, a pipe organ works, right? It can support a fundamental mode and then harmonic modes on top of that. Uh, so we're gonna kind of apply the same idea to Spectrum analyzer. Sorry for wiggling this thing back and forth. None of this works well, right? So we have two mirrors that are high reflectors and we send the laser beam in. But if we misalign the laser, we'll get just rejection of the, the light. It's only gonna bounce around a couple times. So if the laser's not exactly aligned into the optical axis of the spectrum analyzer, we'll get something like this.
and I'm kind of faking it, right? Um, I have two curved mirrors. Their focal length for both mirrors is located at the same position. So I'll actually get pretty good bouncing back and forth for a large number of times, even with slight misalignments. That's the reason to do this with curved mirrors because it kind of helps you out that way. All right, but let's assume I go in exactly on the bore of the device. What happens then? So I could have a situation obtained where the cavity is exactly lambda over two long, and then I would have a single half wavelength standing wave uh, supported in this structure. But let's think for a second. The, the wavelength of a Heaney laser is 632.8 nanometers. I don't need to write that down. I was going to put it on the board, but this is a slow way of doing this, so I'm going to skip that. That would mean that the distance between my two mirrors would be 316.4 nanometers if I did the math right in the head. It's really hard to accurately place two things that distance apart. So we have not the fundamental, but a much higher order mode supported in the cavity. The cavity is probably like eight centimeters long or something. Okay, so I drew this with three halves lambda length. Obviously, we're talking about a very large number of half wavelengths, not three halves lambda. Uh, but it would take me an awful long time to draw trillions of half wavelengths, so we're not going to do that. All right. The cavity spacing allows certain modes to oscillate, right? I will have standing modes that exist inside the spectrum analyzer. Uh, that will allow a buildup of power, right? Because I have power coming in these mirrors reflect 99.5% of the light that hits them in the right wavelength range. And so the power comes in, but only a small amount bleeds out. Now, eventually it has to reach a steady state, right? Power in has to equal power out, or it's going to keep gaining power. And it doesn't do that because the thing doesn't turn into a bomb, right? So eventually we're going to reach the point where the amount of power leaking out of either end is equal to the power in. So I sketched in two tiny arrows to suggest a leak. Now, if I have a lot of power in a mode and I get, you know, 0.1% transmission out through the back, well, then if I have a lot of power in that mode circulating inside the cavity, then I'll get a detectable amount of power out in that 0.1%. All right, so I'm going to put my detector just here. So I'll put a photodiode there. Okay, so I have a photodiode, and then I have my oscilloscope. Okay, if I have a matching condition where the longitudinal mode, the wavelength, matches the spacing between these two mirrors, I'll build up a lot of power. And even though I only leak a small percentage of that power each pass, each time the power is circulating, I will get enough out that I can detect it. And then I'll see a spike of photovoltage at that specific uh, condition when, when the cavity is separated by those 
exact distances. All right, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan the length of the cavity. So now I have some delta x. I'm changing the cavity length. And when I do that, I'm now going to have a mismatch, right? So if I move my mirror a little too far, I'm no longer going to get buildup of power to a significant extent for that wavelength that I sent in. And now I'm not going to get really hardly any light leaking out. And that means I won't get any detected signal, right? OK, then I restore the cavity back to its original wavelength excuse me, back to its original spacing between the two mirrors. I've matched my half wavelengths again, and now I get power building up in the cavity. I get a small amount of leakage, but that leakage is sufficient now for me to observe it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the length of the cavity and see if I observe spikes in the vo uh, photovoltage. And I get this, this comb, this fringe pattern. So I, I increase the cavity length in this direction. And as I do so, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Nothing is matched. I don't have a condition where my wavelengths, wavelength, we're doing a single mode, where my wavelength times a half times some integer n exactly fits into that cavity. So I scan the cavity length, get nothing. And then suddenly, I satisfy this condition where I've matched the cavity to some n times lambda divided by 2, and I get power buildup, and I detect a photovoltage as a result of that leakage, right? And then I just I keep scanning the length. I'm still increasing the cavity length, still increasing, still increasing, still increasing. But now I fit another n divided by 2 times lambda wavelengths into the cavity. So I get another spike again. And then that same pattern repeats. So we're going to draw now one of the curves that you saw on that oscilloscope. All right, so we saw that triangle wave. That was the voltage being applied to the piezo. So the change in cavity length is, to a pretty good approximation, linear with how much of a voltage I put across that device. So I'm increasing the cavity length, and I'm seeing a pattern. And then I decrease the cavity length. I see the same pattern in reverse because I, I, you know, I increase the cavity and I decrease the cavity in the same way. So I've got a, a sort of symmetry. I didn't draw it perfectly, but I've got a symmetry here. It's a mirror image of what was happening on the other side as I changed the cavity length. So this is how a Fabry Perot works. It really is a pipe organ. But instead of being a pipe organ for air, it is a pipe organ for electromagnetic waves. And we fit a n divided by 2 number of wavelengths into our cavity. Is there anything else I should say? Uh, you, you might remember I was fussing about the wavelength of the, uh, the mirrors, right? So I said, oh, the Heaney is better for this anyway because it's matched to the high reflectivity. High reflectivity means I get more power buildup which means I get more leakage. That's counterintuitive, right? I'm going to tell you, oh, the mirrors are better. They trap more power. Well, then I'm going to immediately say, I will see no power leakage out. But you'll always see some power leakage out, and it's a percentage of the power inside the cavity, the power that's built up. So if I build up power more effectively, I'll actually get more power out back at this end. Uh, there's a way to describe this, right? It's something we're familiar with. It's a Q factor. This is a resonator. We're putting energy into the system. Does the energy build up or does it dissipate? How would energy dissipate in the system? Well, there could be some absorption in this material. It's not perfect, right? It's not a perfect optical system that's, that's done on paper. It's real materials. There's more likely than that going to be eventual misalignment. You remember when I drew my first wave into this? I said, oh, what if we don't align it just right? It gets rejected. 
and we lose that power out of the cavity. It's very hard to perfectly align the laser into this thing. It takes a little while, especially if you haven't done it for five years like I have. So we will mostly lose power out of the cavity due to misalignments. The light not staying in there long enough to help build up the power and losing out perpendicularly in that fashion. Uh, we're adding power the, in the entire time. We're taking a small amount out at the entire time. It will reach a steady state. Those two things will be matched. So really it's a question of our alignment into the system that determines how much power we, we build up. So when we talk about a resonator, we say, oh, let's, let's imagine you spend a lot of time really perfectly aligning it. What would the Q factor be for this system? And that's a function of how good these reflectors are, right? Because if they're really high reflectors, then I'm gonna get a very, very, very good buildup of power at exactly this wavelength. What if they're kind of crappy reflectors? So I don't think everybody's had electromagnetism yet, uh, but let's talk about how a reflection actually works, right? So this is something you go into in, in, de in some detail in Griffiths, but you probably haven't done it yet in Physics 202. So we're gonna sketch that out quickly. Okay, so I've drawn an interface between two materials. This side I labeled the vacuum, air, anything. This is my material, right? Something that's, that's, that's substantial. So we're gonna say it's a metal and we're gonna get away from the idealization of perfect metals. So if I send in a certain amount of intensity, that's what I've drawn on my y-axis. If I send in a certain intensity of light, you would think, oh, metal's a perfect conductor. I can't have any electric field supported inside my my conductor, so the intensity of that field is going to drop to zero immediately, and it's just going to go off. But that's not really true, because nothing's a perfect conductor. Well, a superconductor, we're going to put out of our, our consideration for the moment. What actually happens is I get some penetration into the material just a little bit, right? This is called the skin depth of the material. If it's a really good conductor, that depth is very shallow. If it's kind of a mediocre conductor, you get an evanescent wave penetrate further into the material. Fine. But the point is, I don't actually have a condition where my electromagnetic wave is just getting chopped at exactly that interface. So the way we've been idealizing this looks like this. This is what I get for doing this in the middle of the night. Okay, so we've been saying, oh, my electromagnetic wave, it just gets chopped off at my mirror. My mirror is uh, probably glass or fused quartz or something like that with a, me a metallic layer on top, a mirror layer uh, deposited on top. And my light just gets killed and reflected all back. But that doesn't actually happen. What actually happens is I get penetration into the material at various depths. So all of my insistence that we're only gonna get N times lambda divided by two wavelengths stacking up inside our system, there's a little bit of a fudge there. The truth is we're actually gonna get a range of wavelengths. They'll all be very, very close to lambda, right?
Okay, so I've got a very tiny range of different wavelengths that will actually be able to build up a standing wave in the system because some of the waves will penetrate a little bit into the material and you'll get power reflected back out. I am being really hand wavy here. It doesn't exactly matter. But one thing we know from our, our studies of waves is that wavelength corresponds to frequency. Those two are connected quantities. So what I'm telling you is I can support a modest, non-zero, it's not just a perfect single function, uh, perfect single wavelength. I can support a modest range of wavelengths inside my cavity. That's another way of saying I can support a modest range of frequencies inside my cavity. So when we have that optical cavity and we talk about how it's a resonator, if we use really high reflectivity mirrors, they're only going to be very, 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 very high reflectivity at exactly one wavelength. They'll be 99.999996% reflective, but at exactly one wavelength. And I'll only get this red wavelength supported. Everything else will get nuked, right? None of those other wavelengths will be supported in oscillation. But if I have kind of so-so reflectors, if I only have 99% or 98.2% reflectors, the system will actually be able to support a broader range of wavelengths. I'll be able to get buildup of a broader range of wavelengths or a broader range of frequencies, if you want to think of it in the terms we've used previously. So it's the difference between saying, in one system, ultra high finesse mirrors, only one wavelength is supported, only one frequency is supported. The other case, I've got some dissipation in the system. The system's a little squishy. And now I can support a range of different frequencies, right? So what is this? This is our Q factor again. So I've drawn Q factors for two different cavities, and it's always the same thing we've seen for all these oscillator systems. This one looks like a delta function. It supports oscillation at just one frequency. I actually plot it as a functional wavelength, doesn't matter. It supports oscillation of just one kind of oscillation, but you can get a huge buildup of power, excuse me, I should say, a huge buildup of energy inside that system. The other possibility is you can support oscillation at a range of frequencies, but it's kind of mediocre for building up power at one particular frequency, right? I can't get the same amount of energy built up because there is dissipation. Dissipation, we intuitively say, oh, dissipation is bad. It is a worse system. It just depends on what you want to do. We've talked about this a little bit, right? Like we all intuitively jump to the idea that the high Q oscillator is the good oscillator and the low Q oscillator is the crap you want to throw out. But the low Q oscillator can actually oscillate at a range of different frequencies. And the high Q oscillator can't. It's, it's just one, one specific frequency. All right, so these are, this is bringing together a bunch of different ideas we've talked about at some length. I hope they're, they're, they're kind of meshing a little bit. I think that's everything I have to say about this. If you have any questions, just shoot me a line. I'll be happy to get back to you.